uh, introduced Mal Mal Malcolm Jones. Um, I first met Malcolm when he worked at the BM in the 1980s. And um, uh, so like, like Rhino, he's a 40 year old uh, friend. Uh, for Malcolm, I kept all his letters and articles in a special ring binder and I have a special fan for all his emails. Uh, <laughs> and um, I'm a great fan of, of this book, um, The Secret Middle Ages. Um, um, he's a great talker, and, and, an incredible expert on words and seals. So over to you, Malcolm. Right. Um, I hope I can find this this, this one. Uh, uh, well, thank you, John. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, yes. that's great. Thank you, John. That's like, that's, I, I, I'm blushing, and I'm glad you can't see me here. But uh, thanks. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to uh, look at uh, all sorts of aspects of personal seals uh, from a sort of popular culture point of view um, and I'm going to show lots of pictures and, and I console myself with the thought that anyone who thinks that pictures have not been on the screen long enough can always catch up perhaps on YouTube later. Um, I'll start straight away with uh, a picture that I showed I hope um, why isn't it why isn't it working um, I need to go do I just click Oh, thank you. Yes. Um, uh, I wanted to get this in because it's one of my favourites. Um, Greet well, Gib, our cat. Uh, uh, and it reminds me that uh, seals are also a value for onomastics, not just place names, personal names, of course, uh, usually of people, but occasionally, as here, of pets. Uh, it turns out that Gib, which is itself a, a pet form, a nickname of the first name Gilbert, uh, and that's why it's appropriate to Gilbert Stone on a, a document sealed by him in the 1390s. Um, that's, that's why when it came to translating the French name of the cat Tibert in the Roman de la Rose, the English translator quite naturally used this very same expression, greet well, give our cat. But I want to start by thinking about the physicality of seals. Um, how they were actually carried about. Were they worn, for example, uh, like a pendant on, on a necklace? Were they kept in a purse at the girdle? Um, so the physically, the things were perhaps amulets that could be carried around, as well as having the, the function of sealing letters, um, but also to look at some of the ambiguous inscriptions. I start with something that isn't a seal at all, this lovely silver ring brooch in the V&A. Um, the legend is in English, uh, and at the bottom of the page, I put from the Middle English Dictionary, which is freely available online, um, all the various spellings that are available for the first person pronoun, the, the I pronoun in Middle English. Um, you'll see that the head form chosen by the dictionary is ish, just as in modern German. Uh, but there are a host of other spellings, including hitch, which we should be coming to later. And this one here, I-H, spelled I-H-C. My argument is that this is a deliberate choice of spelling because it's the same as the abbreviation for the saviour, the, the sacred monogram, which we're used to seeing on all sorts of artifacts, including seals, as here, top left and bottom left, uh, and various, uh, a ring, top right, uh, strap ends, uh, all, all that sort of thing. Um, bottom left, just as this is an actual seal, you'll see the monogram below something which looks rather like an eyebrow, um, but this is in fact, as Elizabeth knew, uh, pointed out almost 20 years ago now in 2002 um, a manuscript abbreviation symbol so here we have the whole message jesus is my love and quite a common seal type on the pas database so this apparently frivolous subject very common subject of the hare riding the hound and blowing a hunting horn as here 
usually accompanied by the legend Soho Robin, Soho being the hunting cry and Robin the name of the dog. Uh, here the legend is Ich am Hunter Gold. Literally, I am a good hunter. But again, you'll notice the form of the personal pronoun that's been chosen is spelt I-H-C, just as in the sacred monogram. On the other side, the inscription actually ends with God, um, putting the adjective after the noun, because it's not normal English word order. So I'm assuming this is a deliberate post positioning and God and Christ separated by the cross in the middle. I'm suggesting that there may well be, that this may well be deliberate. Here, I think we do have, again, a very deliberate placing of the legend. It's divided into three. It starts at seven o'clock with Jesu, and then we have these apparently meaningless two other words, Selbo and Nele. When we divide segment properly, it is, of course, in Anglo-French, je suis seul bon et l'elle. I am a seal, good and faithful. Now, again, I think there's a Trinitarian thing going on here. We've got a triangular figure. We have a flowering heart in the center of the design from which three three-petaled flowers project. So, so I think we have a Trinitarian theme and it's no accident is my argument that the name Jesu or Je suis has been singled out. Uh, I've just left a note there to myself to point out that the language of many of these seals is a kind of French, the kind of French spoken in England in the late Middle Ages, which we call Anglo-French or Anglo-Norman, not the same as Continental French. It has one or two distinguishing features, especially orthographically, and I particularly want to focus on the spelling of key and que with an initial K rather than the QU or QV as it would appear in inscriptions. I also want to point out that many of these legends are metrical and they rhyme. They are both very simple rhyming couplets. Je suis seul, bon et l'eau. Another whole host of seals, matrices from the PAS database, all beginning je suis seul. Because these objects talk. I am a seal of faithful love on the left, or uh, I am a seal. I can't see the top there. Never mind. Um, so, but four of these certainly, uh, I would argue, have Christological uh, significance. The Agnus Dei, uh, top centre, obviously, a symbol for Christ. The pelican in her piety, as the motif is known, bottom right, another well-known symbol for Christ's sacrifice. On the left, although this is clearly uh, an amatory seal and more appropriate to uh, to human lovers, um, the, with the, with the, the, the turtle doves billing and cooing. We still have, however, the sacred monogram initials, IH below, the sort of perch they're on, and C above the beaks. The final matrix, uh, a stag, clearly, with antlers, but a detail that might be missed if we didn't know, we weren't aware of its possibility, is the cross between the antlers. This is actually a reference to a vision of St. Eustace, but also St. Hubert. They both had the same vision of the crucifix with the crucified Christ appearing on it between the antlers of the stag. So we have quite a common type on the left here, uh, just the stag's head with the cross between the antlers. And here the legend, Jesus Merci, which I have seen translated Jesus Thanks, but it is of course here, Mercy, not Thanks. And uh, although fairly rare in English iconography, uh, a vision of St. Eustace from a manuscript now in Venice on the right. While we're on sort of popular religion, I wanted to show this. Um, after St. Edmund was martyred by the Vikings in 870, uh, it, his head was missing. And according to legend, it was eventually found by a wolf. So here in the center of the seal is the wolf, finding St. Edmund's head, and the head itself is speaking the legend, saying, here, 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 hitch am, here, 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 I am. There's that, a different spelling of the personal pronoun there, which I suspect is perhaps for the sake of the alliteration. 
And of course, this was found about 10 miles due east of Bury St Edmunds in Suffolk. Rinald just showed us this very same seal. Um, I don't know what you think, Rinald, but uh, on the right hand side is uh, a, an impression of what I think may even be this very seal in the National Archives. Uh, as you said, there's some doubt as to whether or not it was actually found in Ireland. I think it's part of the Roach Smith collection. Um, but what I'd like to focus on really is the fact that the seal itself, which reuses this antique sard, may well itself be physically considered an, an amulet, a talisman. Maybe that's, I'm not sure if that's a suspension loop at the top or not, but as I say, one could carry it in one's purse, or if it is a suspension loop, perhaps on a necklace around the neck. Uh, but also I want to consider the significance of this word port, because obviously it can mean to carry, but it can also mean to wear. Lots of things from the, in, in Anglo-Norman inscriptions from small items from the late Middle Ages, um, just talk about being carried or worn. This uh, lovely ring, which I think has disappeared, but was shown in the uh, 18, in, in the early 19th century, uh, qui me portera, exploitera et à grand joie reviendra. So uh, there it is. Who wears me will be successful and return in great joy. So clearly a ring is worn rather than carried. This I had to show this lovely thing. It's a, a, a tiny uh, lead badge. Now it's ended up in Prague Museum of Decorative Arts, but it's inscribed with the legend, Bien Ea qui me porte. May he have uh, well who wears me or who carries me wears, I think in this. But the, the I'm just impressed by the sheer uh, execution of the thing, the detail on, a, on an item which is only about three centimeters wide, the rib cage of the greyhound, the decorated collar, and whether or not it's anything to do with the cult of the uh, canonized greyhound, St. Guinefor, which is an extraordinary story in its own right, uh, I'm not gonna go into now. A selection of objects, all of which are avowedly talismanic. They all say, we will bring good luck to those who wear us or carry us. A couple of pilgrim signs, bottom left, the badge we've just seen on bottom right, a ring brooch, top left, and a finger ring from the portable antiquity scheme, top right. And here again, I just want to point out the spelling, what I regard as a diagnostic Anglo-French spelling using the K, K rather than the QV for the relative pronoun. So I couldn't resist also showing this because uh, you'll have to take my word for it, I'm afraid that it does actually begin with Kima Portera on one of the other examples, one in the Museum of London, another in Regensburg, something of an outlier. Uh, it's a lead mirror case and it shows climactic episodes in the Tristram and Isolde legend. We have Tristram himself, uh, Isolde and her maid, Tristram's dog at the bottom, and King Mark arriving on a horse on the right. Um, this was found in Perth exactly a century ago uh, it, during the excavation of a well. Whoever carries me will not lack for joy, I am well loved. So we have to imagine this being carried around perhaps in a purse. And a fine example to my mind of the trickle down of the iconography of courtly love into a rather some more humble medium. We still regard the four-leaf clover today as lucky. The six seals on the left, one an impression in the National Academy, uh, National Archives, sorry, uh, all are, to my mind, four-leaf clovers. Um, as early as 1510, Winkinder Word published in London uh, a volume called The Gospels of Distaves. In fact, a translation of a late 15th century French work, this Evangile de Canouille, but it's full of fascinating information about superstition. He that findeth the trayful with four leaves and keep it in reverence, know for also true as the gospel that he shall be rich all his life. So there's a uh, late 15th century, early 16th century uh, attestation of, of this, of the good luck of finding a four-leaf clover. 
The majority of matrices that bear this device actually bear the legend of the one at the bottom left, Lel Ami Ave, you have a faithful lover. So there's a sort of amatory implication, perhaps. The commonest of all seal legends is the one borne by this, the, by the seal top left, Privesu, I am private. Uh, the one top right, again, it seems to me, bearing this uh, ambiguity that I was just talking about earlier, that the word Jesus is actually significantly spaced on the perimeter legend from the rest, as if Jesus is, also, is, is uh, available by itself. Uh, bottom right, two little lead badges in the form of, I would argue, a four-leaf clover, one on the right with the initial T in the centre, probably for Thomas, Thomas Beckett, Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, these are found at Canterbury as well. So um, some of the associations of the, the four-leaf clover as a luck bringer. And as I say, if you carried your personal seal around with you, then maybe you had this sort of lucky charm with you all the time. I couldn't resist showing this image because it's just so extraordinary. Uh, the head of God the Father in this early 14th century English Psalter replaced with a four-leaf clover or possibly a true love. Um, again, another of De Word's publications, The Four Leaves of the True Love, uh, is said to symbolize the three persons of the Trinity plus the Virgin. And true love is a contemporary late medieval name for a four-leafed plant, not unlike the clover, and there, there's the Latin name for it. And at the bottom of this page, a shameless plug for my medieval book, but uh, John has already done that for me, so thank you for that, John. <clears throat> Moving on to horseshoes, of course, are another lucky find. At the very bottom of this page, I've quoted again from the Gospel of Distaves. He that findeth a horseshoe or a piece of one, and note that, I want to come back to a piece of one. He that findeth a horseshoe or a piece of one, he shall have good fortune. And this is uh, 1510 then. Um, but we can be sure this isn't simply uh, a French or Flemish uh, superstition. It is current in Britain as well, because G.R. Oust quotes in the, in the quotation just above, um, in a long discourse on types of idolatry by a late 14th century English preacher, uh, horseshoes and iron nails are, are reckoned as lucky finds. This particular impression is attached to a document in the public record office, um, which mentions a certain Walter of Purton, who was a blacksmith. Uh, so clearly, um, as the legend is uh, in the name of Saint Eloi, Eligius, and he is the patron saint of blacksmiths and farriers, clearly uh, appropriate to Walter of Purton. Um, Chaucer's prioress in the general prologue, prologue uh, the only, the mildest oath she allows herself is by Saint Loy. Her greatest oath was but be Saint Loy, and French she spak after the score of Stratford at a bow, for French of Paris was to hear un kno. So this is often regarded as a sort of Chaucer's sort of snide comment uh, as, as to the prioress's French, but I think he's, he's, he's making us aware that he is aware that the kind of French spoken in London is not the same as the kind of French spoken in Paris. So here we have a, a contemporary witness to the currency of Anglo-Norman in 14th century London. Uh, so horseshoes, lucky finds, notice that this one is, is uh, upside down, heels downwards. Couple more horseshoe seals. Uh, believe it or not, people were actually called horseshoes from 13th, 14th century examples at the top of the page there. Uh, those, by the way, come from the very final item in the Middle English Dictionary under horseshoe. And the very final item in all their entries uh, is, is a very, very, very useful uh, collection of the use of the word in question in place names and personal names, as here. So we have a Gerard horseshoe on the left, uh, and the uh, a marshal, in this sense, a, a farrier or a shoeing smith on the right. Notice the uh, Gerard's horseshoe is positioned with the heels upward, and 
Pearson's with the heels downwards. We still say, I think, in uh, in modern Britain, uh, well, it, it, if you're putting a lucky horseshoe up, if you, you put it with the heels upwards. Otherwise, as people say, the luck will fall out. So I was interested to see, well, did this superstition still, uh, uh, what, was this the, the, the fact in the Middle Ages? So here's a couple more. Um, we have a lead badge, Dutch lead badge on the, on the left there with a crown on top. So clearly to be oriented in that direction. And an English pottery jug in the BM below. Again, the horseshoe put with heels pointing downwards. And then on the right, wonderful drawing by the Swiss artist Urs Graf. You can see his monogram at the base of the shrine there and the date just above it, 1516, which seems to be hedging its bets here. We have uh, one horseshoe heels upwards, one horseshoe heels downwards, and there on the right is a piece of one. So even a piece of a horseshoe, as, as we know from winking the words, gospels of his days, is worth preserving and putting up. Uh, folklore and folk life, we're already in that in that area, I think. To keep in mind the time. Um, here is a, a well-known, though it deserves to be better known, image of the man in the moon uh, on a document in uh, the public record office dated 1335, uh, a, a, a nice Latin text, um, very learned production this, and you can see the, the man in the, the moon, who was banished there, by the way, according to medieval belief, for collecting firewood on the Sabbath. So he has a bunch of thorns, which he would have used for, for kindling his fire, on a stick over his shoulder. Uh, there's his little dog as well. And it's very reminiscent of the, of the passage in Midsummer Night's Dream, where um, the, 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 the mechanicals are, are doing their play, and they say, this man with lanthorn, dog, and bush of thorn presenteth moonshine. They, they spell it out for us, just as already we see here on the seal in the 14th century. A couple of matrices of a very simple design, a single masted ship. And uh, on the left, uh, I could make nothing of that legend when I transcribed it uh, like that. It didn't seem to mean anything <laughs> to me. Uh, on the right, a rather more sophisticated production, perhaps uh, quite an elegant piece of engraving. Um, so I think we can be sort of hopeful that Rumilov was meaningful at the time. Um, once I pronounced it Rumelo to myself, I thought, Rumbolo, heave ho, rumbolo, which is a sea shanty. And to my delight, on the database, and this is the value of a database, one can simply say, send me all these seal matrices that have ships on them. On, to my delight, I found a Hertfordshire matrix with heave o, rumbolo on it. The whole, the whole phrase, the whole sea shanty phrase, heave ho rumbolo. And, and just in case you think I'm making all this up, um, here from the Middle English Dictionary are some verses using the same phrase, um, and one I've added myself from Wilson's Lost Literature. Hail and ho rumbolo, steer well the good ship and let the wind blow. So we know this is the contemporary sea shanty, and that appears on these matrices. Uh, a time for a little look at uh, some aspects of the world turned upside down. Um, I'm always complaining that uh, Bruegel's Proverbs picture is not medieval, though it's often used to illustrate studies of medieval proverbs. But there is his sign of the world turned upside down, which sort of tells us how to read that painting as a whole. Um, I'm not aware of this particular motif in something of a 15th century date, but nearest I can find is on the right here, um, a detail on the woodcut from the early 16th century Paris uh, with the image of the orb inverted. And it says at the bottom there, Hélas, monde, retourne-toi à l'aventure. So I'm dealing with the world turned upside down on seals and specifically with the hare, the animal, the hare, as a principal actor in the monde renversé. This will be familiar, I'm sure, to almost everybody. Um, Bosch's extraordinary triptych usually goes by the title in English of the Garden of Earthly Delights. I want to look at one detail in the hell panel on the right at the bottom. 
and it's this one where we see a hare with a hunting horn uh, and a stick or spear over his shoulder, a human being dangling in front of him and two dogs ahead of him who have already caught another, another, another uh, victim. And also a, a quick note of the hare's purse there. You see a nice, nice, very nice late medieval purse, the purse bar and, and the bag. Already by Bosch's time, if we say circa 1500 for that painting, uh, this is, is a venerable motif. We have 13th, 14th and earlier 15th century examples here. The uh, famous Roman d'Alexandre manuscript in the Bodleian on the left there, uh, particularly well known, I think. One of, one of the, one of the hares has uh, trapped a man up a tree there, you see. The other one is gleefully uh, treading about to uh, to strengthen to to span his crossbow, and you notice the detail there. He's the little paw is in the stirrup of the crossbow, and he's straining to pull it up. Wonderful stuff. And sure enough, on the database we have the same image. Um, the finder of this was kind enough to send it to me in a matchbox, um, so I had great fun trying to puzzle away at the legend. And this is this is as far as I've got with it so far. Not entirely convincing but I hope you'll agree it is at least the same motif. The two dogs on leashes, the little man dangling behind his shoulder. Um, and we must never forget that these things are tiny. Um, there, there's, this, is, this is 19 millimeters wide, this whole canvas. I've reversed it bottom right there just to show how very similar it is to another find, which unfortunately the, the legend is no clearer, but it's not, and it's not the same, so it doesn't really get us any further. This is the classic image of the hare on the dog blowing the hunting horn off to, off to hunt humans, presumably in the wood. Je vois à bois. Another hare with a, a bow, an ordinary bow this time, and I just use this to illustrate uh, how these things, how these legends can mislead. I made the basic uh, mistake here, the beginner's mistake of trying to read this inscription with the uh, image oriented like, like that. I should, of course, have looked for the cross or star that shows you where the legend begins and this you'll see I've, I've turned it around a little on the right there at which point after a while I realize the legend read like that um, where my bow beware my bow so it's uh, it's just a sort of humorous uh, legend another hair with uh, another bow uh, and this time we have a squirrel in a tree I hope you can see that uh, this is an impression um, from the from the database. And I puzzled away at this legend for some time. I think, I think it says, woe me, what? Stroya. Stroya, as used by Chaucer, means killer. Uh, woe me is just woe's me. And what is one of the many names for the hare? So I think this is uh, a, a killer hare again, a hare on, on the rampage with his bow. This is the classic image of the hare on the dog with the hunting horn yet again. Um, this time the label seems to be alone I ride a river. I, I spent some time looking for rivers initially and then I, I realized there weren't any rivers and it couldn't possibly be river. So my, my latest conclusion is that I think it has to be some version of a revers, that this is renversé in the monde renversé sense. Um, this is, that's what the, the river bit means. Again, the same image, uh, but this time the one on the left in particular is holding a bird, perhaps a, a, a hawk of some kind. Um, and the, the legend is slightly different. Alone I ride, have I no swain, meaning uh, no, no squire, I suppose. Occasionally we have descriptions in, for example, the Pudsey Deeds here, Yorkshire Record Society volume, uh, of the seals attached to documents, even if we can't access the seals themselves. And here you'll notice, and you'll understand why I think, that the, uh, the author has mistakenly described the seal as a woman riding a dog, hawk on wrist, long streamers behind her head. Well, of course, the long streamers are, in fact, the, the hare's ears. But of course, unless you're familiar with, the, with this sort of uh, grotesquerie, uh, how could you be expected to know that? Uh, 
a couple more hairs, the hunting cry Soho, and this time the hair is addressed as Scut, another of the many proper names for the hair, and again, another datable record of the use of it on a Pudsey D, circa 1312. Here we're in a quite different world. We still have the same hunting cry, but the hare this time has the face and the mitre of a bishop. So what's going on here? Soho Levesque, Soho Bishop. What, 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 a, what, a, strange, what a strange thing. I, 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 I can't in immediately suggest what's happening here, but maybe it's something to do with the, the ribaldry, the inversion, of the, the boy bishop ceremony, which I very much think the, the next seal I'm showing you is. This turned up only quite recently, lead, quite crude, as you see, um, crudely designed, and it purports to be the seal of Henry, Archbishop of Orwell. Well, Orwell is a small village in Cambridgeshire. It's probably lucky if it has a priest and it certainly wouldn't have an archbishop. So I think this is nothing less than uh, a, a spoof seal, part of the regalia of the, the boy bishop uh, over that Christmas, that, 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 those sort of in, that inversion ceremony um, and, and celebration. Uh, East Anglia, of course, being exactly the area in which the many boy bishop tokens uh, have been found as well. Uh, I think I better stop because I think I'm going on too long. Um, thank, 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 thank you very much. Thank you very much, Malcolm. Do, do you want to have a couple of sentences to round things um, up? Yes. Uh, okay. What... Thank, thanks. Yes. Um, um, I, 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 as you see, I, I've been looking at humour on seals as well, it, it, to a certain degree. Um, uh, this this one of the. the I, I was going to come on to to look at the 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 ape on the, the back of the ass, holding an owl instead of a hawk. Um, again, I suspect a sort of a subtle satire on the, on the noble hunt of hawking. Um, here is more or less than ape, owl, ass. Clearly a popular, a popular motif, uh, as in this lovely matrix from the Isle of Wight on the left there. Not just in seals, but also There's a, Durham, there's a Durham example where it's dated, but also in manuscript. Here is a, an early 14th century manuscript now in New York, where the same scene is actually labeled in English, although the text of the manuscript is in Latin. Here and is no less than an ape and an owl and an ass. And wonderful preacher, early 14th century preacher, Robert of Basevorn, in the middle of his Latin sermon on human vanity, actually breaks off to illustrate our this very, this very seal, I think, that we've been looking at, this very type, uh, suddenly goes into English, neither more nor less than ape and owl and ass. So I'm just going to stop there and say that uh, there are lots of popular cultural uh, insights to be gained from thieves. I shall stop there. Right. Well, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. That was a marvellous... Uh, Roundup of uh, proverbs, of wisdom, um, readings, and humour. Um, excellent. Um, do you think, Malcolm, that the presence of these um, uh, things, particularly the mottos, the man in the moon around around thirteen hundred, really tells us something about how literate? and what appreciation people had um, who used these seals. Well, I, I think I do, John, yes. I mean, I, I, think, I, think, I think the implications for literacy are very important, I think. Um, and, but, but, and even, even, if, even if you weren't yourself literate, I think you could still enjoy the joke or have it explained to you. Um, yeah. So yes. Good. Mm. So so we could uh, possibly uh, trace the whole uh, level of literacy across the country by the use of the, of, of these seals. Mm. In, interesting idea. I mean, <laughs> yes. Anyway, thank thank you very much.